Uh, okay, so hi everyone. Um, hi. hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Dan Coyce. I'm the culture editor at Slate. Uh, I write about comics. I'm one of the judges for the Cartoonist Studio Prize, which is our prize that we run with the Center for Cartoon Studies. Um, and I'm really honored to be here talking with Phoebe Gluckner. In her illustrated right. novel, Diary of a Teenage Girl, I got to do a whole introduction. It's like a formal, it's a formality. I just interrupted to yeah, correct no my, the pronunciation of my name. Right. Gluckner. Gluckner. <laughs> In her illustrated novel, Diary of a Teenage Girl, Phoebe Gluckner has her 15-year-old heroine, Minnie Getz, remember a call she once received out of the blue from her long-absent father. She says, he told me that my eyes were just like his and that we know things other people can't know. I came back to that line many times after reading Diary of a Teenage Girl, which is based on Phoebe's own teenage journals of growing up in San Francisco in the 1970s. The book is particularly crucial for the way that it, too, seems to know things that other people can't know, to tell stories that for a long time everyone else was unwilling or unable to tell. The book is ferociously honest and interested in both the sexual development and the intellectual development of a teenage girl, two subjects that popular art have often have real trouble presenting non-judgmentally. Marielle Heller's excellent film of the book starring Belle Powley, Kristen Wiig, and Alexander Skarsgård is in theaters now. Phoebe is also the author of A Child's Life and Other Stories, as well as an accomplished medical illustrator. She's a professor at the University of Michigan Stamps School of Art and Design. So please give a warm welcome to Phoebe Gluckner. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start um, with a question about form. Um, you, I think it's not auto-playing. Oh, there we go. Um, you, before you actually created the book, Diary of a Teenage Girl, you had been working over a lot of that material for years and years and years in a lot of different kinds of work. Um, you made comics, you teased out the story in, in different ways, and you said in interviews that you didn't even really know what the book was going to be, what it really truly was going to be until you were done making it. Um, in the end, for those of you who haven't necessarily seen the book, it is a combination of edited diary entries of comics and drawings made contemporaneously with the events depicted, and then comics and drawings made later uh, in the creation of the book. So how did that form evolve over time, and how in the end did you settle on the form that you used to tell that story? Well, initially all I had was um, my original diaries, which were mostly typewritten on binder paper and stuck into a binder. Um, and, you know, 20 years after I wrote them, I, I looked at, look, I opened the box and I looked at them and, uh, I started reading them and they just, it was like a slap in the face. I felt like there was someone talking to me directly that, uh, w was suddenly very real. And I just felt this incredible, like, pang of pain and, and, almost a desperation to let that person out of the box and give voice to that person, a voice that other people could hear. Um, and for me, you know, at that point, because I was much older, the character, who was Minnie Getz, who was based on me, um, I realized she had become to me not necessarily an incarnation of myself when I made her into a character, but any girl. And that was the only way I could look at it and really do her justice because um, when I was a teenager, I didn't like myself. I you know, had a lot of self-hatred. I mean, I think a lot of teenagers do, and insecurities. And um, I knew that if I let that uh, leak into the book as an adult writing that uh, none of you, no one would have ever liked that character. I had to have more of a, an open heart, so she is any girl to me. It's kind of a schizophrenic thing where I separated from her and tried to look at her differently. But anyway, that's not addressing the form. So anyway, I had these diaries, and they felt like raw documents, which they were. And they were almost precious in that sense. You know, if I changed any of them, I was altering reality. But yet, if I had tried to even publish them the way they were, I mean, in life, there's so many, there's so many things that happen. 
there's so many people, and you know, if you're telling a story, most of those people are going to end up being extraneous to the, the heart of the story. So there really was going to have to be a lot of editing, rewriting, and you know, uh, rearranging things and collapsing time, expanding time. I mean, uh, although the diaries are often, I guess I'm the only one who knows, <laughs> which passages are verbatim and which aren't, but there, there's quite a bit that is Minnie's original words, that are Minnie's original words. But on the other hand, um, in altering them, my goal was to really be true. I mean, you know, I, I have, things take me so long to do. I have such a sensitivity, I think, to false notes, and I, you know, I make a million of them, and I, then I become so aware of them that I just have to destroy the work or rewrite it, and I do that again and again and again because the false notes just give, give me this kind of sickness, but I'm um, as subject to them as anyone else. Um, so anyway, so how do you do that? How do you remain true to something but, um, but make a novel out of life? Um, and it was difficult. And I thought originally, okay, well, maybe I can more or less preserve the document, um, clean it up, rearrange it if I had to, but more or less preserve it and present it that way. And then, you know, I always loved I illustrated Victorian novels. Like I have like Zola with, you know, etchings, full page etchings. And, and these books were for adults. And books for adults were often illustrated in the Victorian era before that too. And um, so I tried something like that, and so I was creating full-page illustrations, some of which are preserved in the final book, but I was trying to stick just with that. But as a cartoonist, those static images along with the text, it just, it, I, I want images to be more part of the narrative, to have a, a role in advancing it. And a static image generally becomes redundant of the text. It's describing a person. And the person's already described, but then there's a picture of them. You know, and I, I just couldn't live with that. It made me very uncomfortable. So, but then I thought, of, OK, if I do it all in comics, no, 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 that's not right. Um, not right because you just felt like it would take too long, or not right because then you lose that diary material, which feels important? No, because the point of view would be one. It would be one of reminiscence. I mean, it would be. It would be too much. No, I just didn't want that. And plus, I think I have a tendency to want to. If I if I did comics before, I really wanted to do something different next time. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm not a very prolific artist, and I it, it probably because I've never learned to repeat myself stylistically in a really efficient way. I, I don't like to do it. So, I mean, structure is really interesting to me, I guess, you know, even without thinking about it. So I, I always kind of do something slightly different. I know I'm talking too much. I think I'm just droning on. Can You can rein me in. Yeah, I mean, I think the people out here are literally to he here to hear you talk, so. <laughs> okay, all right. I think it's cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, but so it's it's interesting to me that you said that you, when you read those diaries, it really felt like someone, like that person from the past talking to you specifically. Mm -hmm. Because so many of the diary entries, at least as you present them in the book, were addressed to some future self. A lot yeah. of those really were, hey, you know, many 20 years from now, many 30 years from now, here's what I wish I could tell you. Yeah. And when you read them, did you have a sense that you were able to talk back to her a little bit, to that person who sort of was and was not you in 1975? No, I didn't talk back to her. I think that I just felt her very much alive within me. Um, like a little person walking around through the chambers of my heart. A very small person. <laughs> kind of cute by that point, because she's so small. Uh, from a medical illustrator, though, that has a totally different ring. And <laughs> yeah. The idea of a person walking around in the chambers of your heart. <laughs> right. Um, there's in one story that's in A Child's Life uh, that you drew in 1993. You refer to yourself in the in the attribution at the beginning as Phoebe never gets over anything Lechner. 
Yeah. Um, and it, it, re it reads in the context of that story a little bit sarcastically as the response of someone who is being told constantly to just get over things. But I also, it seemed to me also that a, a good memoirist, that's sort of her job. A good memoirist ought never to get over anything because those stories that you have from your past are the material that you are drawing from and that you can return to in different styles over the course of your career. And do you feel that these stories, these the, the story of your childhood in particular in San Francisco is a well that you have been able to, to tell, a well of stories you've been able to tell in different ways over time? Yes, I've, I've done that. I mean, I, I guess I've done it since I was a child. I was kind of, um, even as a teenager, as I started doing this comic called Minnie the Minor. And by the way, the name Minnie becomes from, my name is Phoebe. My mother's name is Mary Lou. But when she, around the time I was born, she started calling herself Phoebe. And then I was named Phoebe. But she's never changed her name to Phoebe. But consequently, I was always called Little Phoebe. That's uh, such a power move from a mom. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, yeah. But I always resented it because I was oppositional and that's not her real name, it's not Phoebe, and I always called her Mary Lou, you know. But um, anyway, so little Phoebe became Minnie, see? Um, makes perfect sense. What did you ask me? Uh, well, I just asked you basically that about how you have retold these stories over the course of time. So you were starting with, as a teenager, you wrote Minnie the Minor. Right, which and, was like a first crack at these stories. Right, and, and I think Minnie the Miner was very much this girl walking through the city, just kind of reflecting and lost. And well, I don't know, I don't remember. But anyway, no, I think that memory is fascinating. I mean, you're right. I was always told you never get over anything. Why are you thinking about this again? Who cares? Get a life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, you get kind of hostile. It, they are hostile responses, and it, it hurts. And then you wonder, what's wrong with me? Why do, do I not have a life? You know. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, no one really remembers anything. What you remember is the emotional part of it, and it's very selective. I mean, obviously, you know that if you've ever kept a diary. You, you go back to it and you're surprised by certain things and other things you remember very clearly. Um, and over time I found even like doing story after story of, of kind of a similar scene in my life, an event, that it changes so much. I mean, it's an actually a very powerful feeling because you, you realize that you are, you become a manipulator of memory. And in that sense, you can really control what a story means. And so when I abandoned this idea of um, preserving this thing as a document, I was really free to make it a book, a novel, that felt exactly how I felt and what I wanted you to feel. Um, and it, it that couldn't have been done, I think, without artifice and, and destruction, I mean destruction of part of the past and, you know, resurrection of, of other parts. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, the way that I think the studies really do show that the way that we tell the stories of our past dramatically affect how the stories live and evolve in our own minds. And so I think probably everyone here has had that experience of a story that you've told about your childhood over and over and over again, and then at some point you go back to the source, to a diary, or to your, to a parent, and you find out that in fact you've been remembering it wrong, wrong forever. That it that it happened differently than the story you've told. But at that point, it doesn't matter. The story that you've been telling is what matters. Yeah, you've been telling how you it affects you and how it defines you. Right. And 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 even those other sources you mentioned, your parents or your diaries, th those sources are suspect as well. Yeah. Right, because, I mean, history is bullshit. You know for the same reason. If you take one thing away from this, everyone, <laughs> please remember it's that history is bullshit. Um, in, a, in a recent interview, you mentioned that, um, that you had thought at, at times in the past about, uh, about making a film out of this material, but that you said that if you had made that film, um, 
you would have made a film that, that you said that, quote, would hurt to watch, that it wouldn't have been lighthearted, and you said that hardly anyone would want to see it. What are, do you think are the advantages of the kind of film that Marielle Heller did eventually make of this material? What are the advantages of, of a slightly more lighthearted, easier to take version of this story? Well, for me personally, um, I mean, I must say that, uh, you know, m books, I mean, movies, you know, hit buttons. They've got music, they got everything. And um, I think Marielle did a wonderful job of incorporating those elements. And when I first saw the movie the whole way through, uh, I responded to that and I felt happy and elated. And it made me feel. Um, well, maybe it's not so bad that, you know, this movie doesn't, like, sink Minnie into the depths that she gets to in the book. Um, Is that the first time you had responded to this material as in a happy and elated way? No, I think, actually, the book is kind of hilarious. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, seriously, I, there's so many things in there that I put in there because it made me laugh. And, um, I mean, I always do that. But then everyone tells me that my book, my work is... Oh my God, it's so deep and so, you know. But, so I have no idea if anyone else picks up on it. And I think the book has a happy ending, but it's a very different ending. Um, I think Marielle um, simplified a lot of the characters, didn't really go as much into in Minnie's intellectual development at right. all. And, um, but nevertheless, she, I think she caught the spirit of the girl. And, and so I accept that. There's, um, but the mother is um, kind of abbreviated and. Uh, She's way easier to take in the movie. Way easier to yeah. take. Um, but 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 I don't mind that. I mean, simply because I mean, Marielle has none of my memories, doesn't know my life. But this is just another way that stories are changed. I mean, she read the book. She was obsessed with the book. Why? I mean. You know, it's not the book, it's what she has experienced before and what she's responding to. I mean, once a book or a painting is out of your hands, it's like you have no control over it and you're lucky if people respond to it. And um, so I know that Marielle had a, a more, a happier childhood than I did, okay? She didn't, she didn't hit those really dark depths that I did as a kid and um, I think a lot of those parts kind of frightened her. And she wanted Minnie to end up happy in a way that she understood in the context of her life. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she did it. And it, it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's another Minnie, but it's, uh, it, it's kind of cool to see that. Uh, I don't know, it's like, you know, rabbits or something just reproducing and, oh, there's another one that's got a spot on its head. You know, it's a little bit different. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do, you, um, I, do you have a sense? One of the things that really struck me about the movie was the casting not only of Belle Polly, who's really great as Minnie, and Kristen Wiig, who's really great as a mom, but of the, the objects of affection in that movie are played by people who are like so astonishingly gorgeous, like out of control gorgeous. Yeah. Um, Alexander Skarsgård, uh, who plays Monroe, and um, the actress who plays... Uh, Tabitha. Oh, she's so hot. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm serious. Well, but so it's like, it's yeah. like a f totally fascinating <laughs> choice as a director because they're presented as attractive in the book, but, you know, as fairly conventionally attractive and not sort of out of control you are movie so star attractive. judgmental. Because That's you know right. what? I mean, right. Minnie says repeatedly and tells us she thought that Monroe was the handsomest man in the world. Oh, yes, the most beautiful man in the world. Absolutely, and yeah. Tabitha was the most beautiful woman in the world. And she was, and yeah. he was. And that was what she saw. So perhaps the director didn't find the illustrations in the book as beautiful as, as I did. <laughs> um, and so she, she settled on a more standard a, a level of attraction that would please you, for example. Or an audience way. in general. I mean, they seem yeah. designed to help an audience find their way into Minnie's world view. For them to be, even if briefly, even if briefly, sort of just as overwhelmed with aesthetic lust as she was in those moments, which I thought was totally, fa like a totally right, fascinating Right, but they did kind of like ugly down Alexander with the 
the the mustache and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, oh yes, but he was hideous. They didn't like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you like him, huh? Right, okay. Raise your hand if you don't like Alexander Skarsgård. No, but I tell, this thing is not cycling, so I'm just gonna like hit buttons with my finger. But yeah. no, but I'll tell you, a Margarita, Russian name, is a... Uh, <laughs> La Laviva, Margarita right. Laviva. Yeah, I was on set quite a bit of the time, and um, the night that I first met her, they were shooting this scene at the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And then, you know, Marielle's telling me, that's, that's Tabitha, that's Tabitha right there. And I'm like, oh. And I went up to her and she goes, hi, babe. <laughs> I mean, and she was like, practically had me in a corner, like, like licking my face. <laughs> and I was like, fuck. I mean, and, and then someone explained to me, she's not going to get out of character. She's been doing this all day. She cannot get out of character. And it was just like so, I mean, she acted exactly like this girl. <laughs> I mean, it was um, mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, so there, the movie uses uh, animation in really interesting ways. Uh, it animates a lot of the sort of key moments in the character's life. Uh, there are little mini flourishes of animation here and there, and then there are sort of longish animated sequences, one of which, which is really fun, actually is a sort of an animated version of the first comic you made as that's presented in the book called A Walk Through the City. Um, I don't know if you have that somewhere on there to show. If it's easy to I find, it might it be fun to show it. Yeah. Um, but oh, that there, yeah. Oh, so yeah, so it's a great, a super fun animated, a sort of short animated version of this. How did that come about? And do, did you participate in that process at all? Were you totally surprised when you saw it? No, I, I, I saw the animation all along. I was asked if I wanted to do it. Um, I mean, I was asked at many points whether I wanted to be more involved. But honestly, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's my diary from when I was 15, and it, then it became a novel, and it's like, you know, do I really want to like think about this fucking story? My whole, I mean, you know. So I just I th I considered it, but I mean, like I said, if I had made the film, it would have been very different, and yeah. it would have been a different kind of creative act. And but to co collaborate on something like this when I knew that Marielle was really coming from a different place, it, it seemed w wiser and more generous to myself to 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 let her kind of guide that mm -hmm. yeah um so stepping away from the movie and the book a little bit one thing that i th have always found really fascinating throughout your career and something that we've seen in some of the illustrations we put up are that you do have uh, you have a master's degree in biomedical communication mm -hmm. and you have done a lot of uh medical illustration for a lot of different subject a lot of different sources and, and publications how in the end do you feel like that has influenced your cartoon work specifically, your cartooning work specifically? Well, honestly, um, my interest in cartooning was a concurrent development with my interest in, in medical art. Um, my grandmother was a doctor. She was kind of a famous doctor at the time. She was the first uh, female vice president of the AMA. And, that, and at the time, that was like the highest position a woman had ever held. Um, and for whatever reason, even though I was a total fuck up in school, people thought I was smart and my grandfather was certain that I had to go to medical school, be like my grandmother. But, you know, I don't have a nurturing bone in my body. I mean, well, I do, but, you know, but I'm, I'm distracted. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, but nevertheless, I mean, my grandmother was odd in that she had, you know, she was a doctor during World War II and, and beyond, but, in her, she had her office in the bottom of her home in Conchahawk in Pennsylvania. And when I visited there, I'd sit in the waiting room. And she didn't have like Ladies Home Journal or Sports Illustrated. She had medical journals in the waiting room, which was weird. And I, would, I was obsessed with them. I'd you know, read about different types of surgeries. And um, I mean, I love science. I mean, that's a general term. But I love to know how things work. and. Um, how things fit together, and and so I always in the back of my mind I was like you know wondering. Um, well, anyway, long story short, you know I did this horrible. I went to graduate school for medical illustration after basically flunking out of high school. I did get into San Francisco State University, um, and I was accepted to graduate school before I 
actually got my degree. And I ended up like skipping the last three classes and not going to the final as an undergraduate, and I didn't get my undergraduate degree. But when I got to the graduate school in Dallas, Texas, they didn't ask me for it. So <laughs> I ended up getting the graduate degree with no undergraduate degree. Um, which if only you'd known. You could have just skipped like the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. But, um, you know, within the, the world of medical illustration, so much of it is sequential. I mean, so much of it is directions. How to do this surgery, how to do this, how to do that. And um, so for me, there were so many similarities. And, and I always had a, a compulsion to draw detail. So to me, they fit together very, very well. Mm -hmm. And this, the comics were kind of a reflection of my interest in, in the interior. Well, but at the same time, it made me feel more balanced to know, you know, what your pancreas does and to be able to imagine, you know, the peristaltic motion of my own intestine, you know, so. As a rule, do you think all cartoonists should spend a little time with a cadaver? <laughs> do you? I, I mean, I'd love to see the results. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it makes you know how to draw, but what it does, the first time you touch a dead body, the first time you see a fresh dead body, it's fucking frightening. It, it, it changes your view of life. Um, and I think that's very important for any artist. I'm serious. Um, it's not that you have to go out and seek it, but it's something, especially when you're young, you don't know what death is. And seeing a dead body doesn't make you understand it, but it it's like a lightning bolt. It changes your life. I don't know. Um, so for the past 10 years, you've been working on a project uh, in, uh, by making trips down to Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. Um, how did that project, how did that project start and how did it come about? An actress asked, you know, what, an actress whose parents were journalists, um, she gets a lot of work, so she has money, um, but she's not that famous. Um, she wanted to help the world, so she, she did this book called I Live Here. And for that, she asked a bunch of artists and cartoonists to contribute to it. And several of us went to different countries with her. I think Joe Sacco was in the book. Um, and she asked me to go to Mexico with her to um, interview parents of murder victims. And these were generally women, girls. And I said no. And I said no repeatedly because they just finished Diary of a Teenage Girl. I had two little girls. I was always afraid when I thought of murder. It scared me when I was a kid. I bet none of you were scared of it. But, you know, anyway. I mean, it just kind of freaked me out, and I was kind of dep depressed after writing the book because if you've been writing a book, if you've been de obsessed and immersed in a project for four or five years, when it's over, you feel like you have no reason to live. I mean, it's really this incredible letdown for, I mean, you. It's weird, you'd think you'd be like elated, but for a while you don't know who you are. It's kind of empty. You've and been so wrapped up in that project. Your identity's been so wrapped up in that project for so long. Right, and yeah. then who are you? And so I was at that point and I did not want to go to Mexico. And then she said, but you're the only one who could do it. You're the only one. And, um, and I want you to do it for free too. And, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, she flattered me endlessly. She called me endlessly. Later on, Jessica Abel said that, oh, she asked me first, and I said no. So, I mean, you know. But this is an actress, and they know how to, to flatter, and they know how to smile. And uh, Anyway, I went down with her. And it was a frustrating experience, and it was a very strong experience. Uh, it was frightening. I had never been to Mexico except to Tijuana for half an hour. I didn't speak Spanish, although I speak French, I speak Czech. I never spoke Spanish. And um, I was see seeing the things that scared the shit out of me. And you know, seeing things that were always just fears in the back of my head, and here they were materialized and you know, being unfolding before me. And anyway, I, but the whole book was very politically motivated and um, you know, they were trying to like change my story to make it fit their dogma, and I, I was incredibly frustrated. 
And what I also saw down there is that we were interviewing people that had been interviewed before for similarly th similar things, like about the murders. Of, that's Terry Zweigoff, who did the movie Crumb, and, and Missy, his wife. Anyway, um, we were interviewing people who had been interviewed before for like documentaries about Juarez and stuff. And when I talked to them further, I realized that they had never seen any of the products of the things that they had been involved with. You know, artists, directors, reporters never returned and l showed them, look, I wrote this about your daughter. And it was this, it had developed this kind of like, you know, kind of like jaded mistrust. And, and you know, I decided, okay, I'm doing this thing for Amnesty, then I'm gonna go back. And I, I, because I just felt like a robber. I'm not going to do something about you and then run away and, and get points for it. You know, I'm going to... So I went to different directors. I went to Lourdes Portillo and somebody else and somebody else. I said, look, can I just, like, make multiple copies of your movie and, like, give it to these people? Because I go down there. They were afraid to go down there because they were afraid they were going to get, like, shot because they had done this movie or something. And, you know, I, I'm an idiot and I'm not afraid of anything because I, I don't think people see me you know, which is just a way of allowing myself to do these things. But anyway, so I, I went down and I, Laura Dess, for example, she was like, uh, she, she did the movie Senorita Extraviata, I don't know if it was, but anyway. Yeah, she was happy to give me copies. I didn't have to copy them myself, which is good because my computer was fucked up. Um, and people were very touched to get these copies because if, if they weren't given the products of this work, it's... I mean, you know, if you write a story about someone's daughter, even an article, and they're dead, it's like they feel like their daughter is living a little bit longer. Why wouldn't you try to give it back to them? I don't know, because it's too hard, because you have to go down to a Napa in Juarez, and nobody has a phone, and no one has a toilet, and they're dirty, and it's like there's no mail delivery, and it's a pain in the ass. But So you've been subjecting yourself to that pain in the ass for 10 years now. Yes. For the purpose of telling what story? One story, because I'm not a journalist, and so I'm not going to go in there and look at a situation and, and, and make a story and get out. I wanted people, I wanted to know people. And the hardest thing is, you know, as a white woman from a university who's kind of like a little crazy but very interested in people, I mean, it was still very hard for me to, like, meet these very poor Mexican people, incredibly poor, like very, very poor, and um, have them look at me as anything other than a potential benefactor, you know, who is going to like, you know, help them. And they are, they're kind of kowtowing and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're ex even exaggerating their stories to a certain point because they are telling these stories over and over again. And so it went on for years where I felt in my heart that if I do this enough, I explore this enough, I find out different things, somehow I'm gonna have a, a different kind of connection. And it happened. And I remember the day it happened. I, I was down there and you know, here I am, Phoebe bringing crayons and candy and, and then interviewing everybody. Um, I was talking, I was in their house with Julia and Danielle and all these kids and um, they were asking me something and they said something about my husband. And I, it was about a month after I had learned that he wanted a divorce because he's, well, I found out later, he's in love with his 24-year-old student and he's 62 and he's gonna, you know, I, the fucking thing, well, I have kids, right? And, you know, everything, my whole, the fabric of my life was falling apart. And she asked me about my husband and I just started like, I just started weeping and um, and I told them everything and before this they had never asked me anything about my life except do you have kids and I think they imagined that I live in a mansion and everything you know in El Norte and I was like you know but suddenly <laughs> they realized that my pain was no different than theirs and um, it was perhaps for different reasons but maybe not you know and it was this pain that kind of like leveled the playing field, honest to goodness, and made me a real person. And but I, I didn't plan that. Mm -hmm. It was, um, 
I'm getting off track. It's probably almost time to shut up, right? So, nope. Um, uh, but do you have any images from the project? Oh, yeah, from I the do. Horace project? I do. And I'm sorry that this is not. Um, it's possible that we'll just have to stare at. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's Mary Elena. That's, that's in orange. That's my daughter sitting on the border fence. She's about to jump over. <laughs> um, and this is Euphemia, who's like. Uh, a very masculine girl. She's a lesbian, and she's the only one I saw in this whole neighborhood ever. And um, it's remarkable because, you know, she tells stories like, oh, yeah, I want a man's work. I just do men's work. And I said, what's man's work? I go, I unload boxes and blah, blah, blah. And then she said, oh, I just got fired from my job. And I said, what happened? Well, I was on my period, and I told my boss my back hurt. And, he's, and he said, you know, if you want to do man's work, you've got to be a man. So it's like, you know, she, they fired her. But anyway, she, she's like an incredible character. I don't know why I tell you that. But anyway, um, and then let's see. Oh, you can't see this. But this, this map, this was in I Live Here, that book. I wrote to Google. I wanted to use an aerial map. And they wouldn't write back to me to give me permission. I mean, I don't even know if I should have asked them. But so instead, I had been taking, like, aiming my camera at the sidewalk, walking around, you know, doing it all the time. And I took the cracks in the sidewalk, and I took the bricks, and I took everything else. So this is actually all elements of Juarez, but they're like shrunk down, and I distorted them, and I made them into all the streets and mountains. So. If you look really closely, you can see like cigarette butts in the cracks because it's all the scale is fucked up. But anyway, do you see any? I thought that was kind of cool, but uh, but it took too long. I mean, I should have just used a Google Maps. <laughs> uh, and anyway, this is this is the thing that I did uh, for Amnesty, and I ended up not drawing it because, long story short, I was drawing a sex manual at that time called Joys of Sex Toys. I went to Mexico. I came back with all these stacks of police reports, and on my desk was unfinished work for this sex manual. And the next drawing I had to do was butt plugs. And, you know, I had to draw like you know really soft-looking, you know, Garth Williams-esque pictures of people inserting butt plugs in their butt, and you know the description of how nice it is for some people. And anyway, and then in these police reports. Like there's this one thing that I was reading, I'd read it on the plane, and it was this girl who died very slowly in the desert after being raped, and then they sodomized her with a splintered two by four. And it was still inside of her, and she had bled to death very slowly in the desert. And, you know, I, then there was the butt plugs. And suddenly this like line between love and hate and sex and, and destruction. It was so fucked up in my brain that I, I, I was absolutely confused and I, I, I could not draw this story. I would start drawing it and I'd feel like a murderer. I'd start drawing this, the, the, the butt plugs and I'd feel like this is a joke. Um, so I somehow I decided I, I'm gonna make dolls and I'm gonna kill them and I'm gonna fucking rape them and then I'm gonna like the next day wipe the blood off and they're gonna be alive again. So it was kind of this self-preserving thing, which, as a matter of fact, takes far longer than drawing. <laughs> and that is something that I never would have anticipated um, because I make everything. And, um, and of course, I want to make it look just like it looked as far as possible. Um, so it, for the I Live Here thing, it was reenactments of things I had read in the newspaper. And I rewrote it in in Google Translate language because that's the way I learned Spanish, you know, by just reading the newspaper every day, but with the help of a translator. And I, I just got this, you know, in, if someone is like found dismembered with the body parts in a black plastic bag, the translation is that the body parts were found in a black stock market. I mean, it, it's like all these odd, you know, everybody knows this, but but this rhythm and this kind of language was so. That's how I knew this news. So I, 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 I wrote it that way. And, um, oh, that's just a tiny little animation, something slightly animated. Um, I mean, it was experiment. I don't know why it's there, except that um, for an electronic version of the book, I'm going to have 
animations, but but not animations with a whole lot of narrative content. Just anyway, it doesn't matter. So anyway, so I build these sets and then um, do things to the photograph and make it look, um, you know. See, see, that's kind of like me. And look, see, see, that's kind of my. I've forgotten it. This coat's really old. I never wear it, and it's kind of that coat. Um, so these are just specific murders, and it's some bullshit. Okay. So when do you think? I know you say on your website that you're bad with the concept of time, yeah, but yeah. when do you think this book's? When do you think this project is happening? Well, I've got all the elements, and um, I've been writing a lot. And like I said, I did not finish Diary of a Teenage Girl until the night before I sent it to the printer. So um, <laughs> I. Um, I have a fellowship this year, so since I work in, at a university, it means that I don't have to teach, but I do have to go to a seminar every week and listen to, read academic papers and respond critically to them, even when they're about like you know, Byzantine flora as represented. In, I don't know. Um, so that's, but the point is, I, I I I applied for the fellowship in order to finish this book. So hopefully uh, I will be pretty close to finishing it by the end of the year. And w when it's published, I don't even want to approach a publisher until I understand exactly the form of the book. Right. Because other the otherwise the publisher is telling you, that's ridiculous, you can't sell that, it's a hybrid, and who, it's not a comic, it's not a this. You know? and so I, I have to have it finished because I don't want to be fucked with that way. All right, we have time for questions from the audience. If you guys want to line up at that uh, microphone in the middle, if anyone has questions. If not, we're just, we'll probably sing, maybe? You will? No, no, we'll both we'll sing. We'll both sing? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, we have questions. Sorry. Hi. I, I just don't want to sing. No, um, uh, I reread A Child's Life last night, um, and I think when you were talking about how people say your books are so sad and the movie's like a little bit happier or something, I think maybe part of what's amazing about that book is that you're able to write about these really horrible things, but when you're reading it, you I, you can see that as an author, you've been able to step back from it and that you're kind of okay with talking about it. Mm -hmm. And seeing the dolls and thinking about like self-preservation, I was wondering if you can say anything about self-preservation and writing about trauma, because I, it's really amazing that you were able to write those things. Yeah, oh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that basically I'm a, a very happy person. I mean, I. I've always had a very strong feeling that I love life and it fascinates me. And um, like it's an accident that we're all here and I just can't believe it still. So I've always had that feeling. And so, but I've always had very strong emotions and um, sadness has always been just as strong as this kind of basic joy. Um, and I also know that everyone else has felt these things. So I, for whatever reason, I'm able to forget about myself. I mean, I think lots of people are very self-conscious and they censor themselves, or they think about what someone else will think if they write this or that. And, and to me, it's like, that's my greatest enemy. I, I, I cannot think about the audience. I, because really they're just like me whether they know it or not. And um, so I have to let, I, I don't know, is that an answer sort of? <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, I, well, the, uh, the section about when you were going through making this um, butt plug uh, and sex toy um, book and also dealing with that story of girl who died of this like rape thing, um, you know, you get the um, impression that you can either like take out either joy or destruction out of sex, but um, I personally view as the, the act of sex very um, sort of violent in a way. I, I wonder if you share that um, impression, this act of sex as sort of violent, inherent of it. Itself. Inherently violent? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's kind of, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, when you're a kid, before you know what sex is, when you first hear about it, it's like you almost can't believe it, right? It seems like, what? Um, Kids definitely often go, no, that's not true. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, we'd never really understand it. 
And um, I think oftentimes it is violent. And sometimes that violence is because, you know, we throw ourselves into it in that way because it's almost like a negation of what's happening. Or it, I, I think that it's not always violent, but it's strange. I mean, don't you think about rape too? It's like, you know, unfortunately, it's easier to rape women than men, but it, 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 it's, it's really, there's a physical reason why. Um, and sometimes I wonder if, if women anyway do feel the same violence. I mean, are they capable of feeling that same violence that men might feel, I mean, despite the difference in anatomy? And how does that come out? I, I mean, I think you're right. I think it is a violent thing. It is. Yeah. Right. It does. Right, and sex is too gentle seems kind of ridiculous. I mean, I don't know. Right. Right, but it's hard to generalize. I mean, because other people might have you know the sweetest sex on earth, and you know drink Hennessy and stuff like that. But I don't know. Thank you. This. This, uh, we're sponsored by Hennessy, so thank you for, <laughs> for getting that in. Next question. Um, I have a lot of questions, because oh. I just got into your work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my first question, or really comment, was actually the violence of sex. It seems to be very prevalent in your um, medical artwork. Um, I was interested in that particular piece where <laughs> the blowjob one. Uh, where you make have a medical outline of that. Uh, what was, do you, I know it was written for a particular, the um, something exhibition. For Atrocity the, exhibition. Yeah, Atrocity the JG exhibition. Ballad. Uh, can you describe like the... Okay, well, first of all, why is that interpreted as violent? Because I was thinking about it. it be, because both the man and the woman are in cross-section. Oh. So I'm killing both of them if they're dead, right? So... Um, <laughs> Oh, the way, well, the way I saw it was, um, we usually view it as a kind of intimate act, but the, the act of making it a medical illustration kind of removes us from it. Right. And it becomes almost kind of grotesque. Like, that's a very interesting yet grotesque, because, like, medical illustration, which I, I also find to be very beautiful in its own right, um, is a kind of a removal, a very technical removal. And that's my opinion of it. Yeah. Um. Is pornography a removal? A little bit more. Yeah, I mean, if you've got, if you, I don't want to talk about myself. Okay, if you've got, or if you've got a sure, dick in your mouth. Sure, talk about me. Okay, if yeah. one of you have a dick in your mouth. Sure. Um, it's ridiculous, you're laughing, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's titillating, but it's kind of fucking ridiculous. Um, it's like sticking a hot dog in your mouth or something, it's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know? And so, for me, I mean, there's that level of, uh, but yet, when you're doing it, you're kind of going into this kind of coma state because all the hormones or whatever, it, you know, you feel kind of, it's, when you're having sex, I mean, all these things happen to your brain, right? And you're not, if you start thinking about hot dogs, then, then you don't want to have sex anymore. <laughs> but, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know, the sensuality of sex is all in your brain. And it can really be looked at in so many different ways. And, I mean, maybe part of the violence is also that you see the teeth, and you don't see the teeth normally. Or, or it's kind of threatening. It looks like it could be bitten off, clearly. But even if her whole face was there, she could still bite it off. But, I mean, you're just not aware of that. I don't know. That's not answering the question. Well, but it was pretty intense, though. But before <laughs> I go, I do want to comment that it's very, your work is very important because one, it deals with ch uh, girl ch uh, children who are girls and the sexual lives of women, which I do believe, like the sexual awakening that you see in a Diary of a Teenage Girl is, unpre is unprecedented with women, and yet we always hear about the um, sexual awakening of men. So I think, I personally am very grateful t towards your work. It's like an, um, what R. Crumb kind of did for, um, well, I mean, he was more a little more uh, well, he did it. visceral. But, yeah, he, right. He, but but I, appre I, I appreciate that um, you do this work. Um, however, 
Um, you said like you are non-prolific, but I still think it's very important, and I wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Yeah. We got more questions behind, so let's try and knock a couple more of these out before we get kicked out of this room. Okay, two parts. Um, how have your experiences affected the, your parenting of your teenage daughters, mm -hmm. and have they read your work, and what has their reaction been? Okay, well, first of all, you know, even as Minnie, looking back as Minnie, um, you know, sometimes I think, oh, Minnie was acting so self-destructively and, you know, having sex with different people, it's dangerous, all these things. And maybe she did that because of her, her past or her, her present in the past. Um, but on the other hand, some people do these things. Okay, so I have two kids, and one of them, you know, from all outward appearances, was the perfect child, or at least in high school. I thought she'd be insane, but she wasn't. She got all A's, she never cut school. She offered to do chores, you know. How disappointing. I, <laughs> well, it actually shocked me, because I was expecting to be able, to have to like, take care of someone like me, and I was afraid and I didn't know how, and suddenly she's like taking care of herself, you know. Um, it was very weird. And, um, but then my younger child is the opposite. She's, she's acting very much like I acted when I was a kid. And so, what was your question? I don't know, there was some point was that. Um, Have they read it and how has it affected your parenting? Right, but, but I, I guess what I wanted to say is that, you know, a lot of behaviors in the personality that we're born with, and also the situations of two kids are different within a family, but you know, it, um, they, I didn't want them to read it till they were 15. Uh, I think that the, you know, the older one didn't, but um, the younger one, being the younger one, sh she said, shit, when she was three, and the other one waited till she was 12. <laughs> um, and, and the younger one read anything she wanted and, you know, hid stuff and read it when she was really young. I don't know. Yeah. And what did they think of it? <laughs> they really liked it. I don't think either of them read it the whole way through. They tell me, it, you know, they read it because they weren't supposed to read it, so they read it in little parts or looked through it real quick and then hid it. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't like to think what they think of it. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, I thought it was really interesting when I first found your work that you were a medical illustrator as well because your, uh, your creative work is very stylized. Um, and I, I have an interest in medical illustration personally. And for me, my creative work and, and those things have occupied different spaces. Um, so d did you find that when you were doing scientific or medical work that you had to reel back your stylization and and is that like a different place in your creative yeah. mind because my real interest my real goal in going to graduate school for biomedical communications was not so i could be a medical illustrator my real goal was to do like the atrocity exhibition you know which is you know 10 illustrations for i got paid like a hundred dollars and it took me you know nothing. you paid a hundred bucks for that yeah no research yeah Oh, wait, you can ask me about research. But anyway, okay. so, um, so it paid very little, but, but that's what I wanted to do. And I ended up like doing these you know, horrible illustrations again and again, the same thing, drawing eyeballs. And it, in the end, it was interesting, but it, it, it was never as stimulating as I hoped it would be. And I guess I knew it wouldn't be because it was a, a job. And it was, you know, you're in the service of other people and they're guiding your hand and you have to draw what they say and the way they say. So, um, but what I gained from studying that, or even from the experience of practicing as a medical illustrator, I, I, I did, you know, dissect. I did see lots of surgery. I did get to know all these things. So, um, did that answer? No, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah no, but I it's impossible. To, I know we're trying to wrap it up or anything, uh, uh, but like yeah. the, the creativity that, that's involved in creating your, your personal right. work, is no. that affected by the, the box you have to put your hand into? No, when no, when I'm doing my personal work, then I, I, I'm free. Um, it, when I'm not, you know, I have this, I, I get resentful when I'm drawing things that other people are controlling. I really do, and I don't even do my best work because I'm pissed. <laughs> you know, because... You know, I really want to do whatever I fucking want to do. So, um, yeah, so it's a hard line to cross because you have to do this one thing to support yourself, even though you're not doing it as well as the things that you really love. So, 
but yet you make a whole lot more money doing this other shit. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we have time for one last very fast question. Okay. I found it so interesting about how you said you're drawing, you didn't want your drawing to be static. And so the relationship between the narrative and the image. When you're drawing your stories, what do you think, what does drive your story? Is it an image that you have that you first start drawing and then you write about it? Or do you have a story that you're writing and then the image comes out of that? It always seems to kind of come together. I mean, I, I don't know if it's the same for everybody, but if I remember conversations, I, I remember the intonation of the words, maybe more than the words themselves, and then I always remember expressions. And when I'm drawing, I think a lot of artists do this, like, you know, if I'm drawing like you, then I'll sit like this as I'm drawing. I mean, if I'm drawing someone grieving, I'll be like, you know, you're doing it almost unconsciously. You're feeling this, like you have this visceral mimicking that you're, you're experiencing it, and it's actually doing something to your brain and making you feel whatever feelings that character is feeling, and it just does it. Um, but when I meant that the things were static, I meant that the role was redundant. They are illustrating something that's already in the text. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how single illustrations generally function. So they're not advancing the text at all. Mm -hmm. And that's the aspect of those single images that was frustrating me. Because I, I, I think I like to use words and images together to advance a story kind of equally and together or whatever. Yeah. That sounds beautiful. <laughs> thank thank you. you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Dan. You did it. <laughs>